My guest today is Dr. Ian McDonald, who's lecturer in astrophysics at the Open University and research fellow at the University of Manchester. His research interests include exoplanets and dying stars. Welcome, Ian. Welcome. Yeah, so thanks for doing this. So we're going to talk about um, exoplanets, variety of exoplanets, um, but uh, sort of a specific kind to start with. Uh, so I want to use the, the Nature articles that you have sent to set the context. So in 2017, this one is entitled, The Hunt for Rogue Planets Just Got Tougher. Um, you say most planets live their lives tethered to the star that created them, uh, but some renegade worlds wander across the Milky Way without a host. Uh, two new analyses suggest that Jupiter-sized rogue planets are a lot less common than scientists thought. The galaxy is likely home to around 100 billion of these planets, one study shows, instead of the 200 billion proposed in 2011. 100 billion is still a big number, and uh, this is sort of sort of scary in rogue planets. So they're just sort of wandering around, uh, not going around a star, right? That's right, yes. So they, they, we think there's quite a lot of them around, but we don't really know how many. We can't see them very easily because they're so dark. Um, so we need different methods of trying to identify them and characterize them to see how many of them are out there and what they might be like. And what is sort of the mechanism of formation. So um, when, when you know regular planets form, I guess it's sort of getting all the debris around a star and over time um, become, a, become a planet. Uh, and so that implies that it's going to go around the star. But how do these things get untethered from, uh, where, did they actually have a star uh, to start with or how, how does it happen? Well, there's two theories as to how we get these rogue planets forming. The first might be that they're just like tiny stars that are too small to be a star. They might have formed in a cluster of stars, um, but just be too small to initiate the hydrogen fusion and make stars shine. Um, the alternative is that they're actually things that have formed around stars, but because planets have interacted with each other in their orbits, sometimes planets get kicked around a lot. Um, we think for example, that Jupiter formed further out from the sun than it currently is. Um, and in this process of kicking planets back and forth, some of them might get thrown into their stars and some of them might get ejected from the systems entirely. So when we look at uh, rogue planets, we have potentially these two classes, the tiny stars, the failed stars that are too small, or the stars, uh, the planets that got kicked out from their host star to begin with. And by looking at the distribution of masses of these rogue planets, these free floating planets, as we call them, we can try and work out how these planets formed and how many of them there are. So a, a failed star, um, uh, essentially. So, uh, so in the Milky Way context, uh, that star is going around the center of the galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're not quite um sort of uh moving around uh without a tether i mean th there is a tether of some sort in this case to potentially to the black hole at the center of the galaxy yes um if we think about all stars in the milky way they are going around the center of the galaxy somehow because that's the biggest mass that drags them around but it's a very different scenario considering something that's also going around the star in its own right maybe once every few years or a few hundred years or a few thousand years even compared to something that's going around the middle of the Milky Way once every 200 million years or something like that. Hmm. But the, the second variety, when they get kicked out through some sort of physical process, uh, then uh, the motion could be pretty much anything, right? I mean, it, it depends on where they started. Um, yes, we have some general sense of how fast they should be moving um, because it's limited by um, the amount of energy they can get from the other plants in the system. So it's unlikely to be much more than the speed at which stars move around compared to each other as well, which is admittedly quite a number of miles per second or kilometers per second, if you'd rather. Um, but in cosmological schemes, that's quite slow. Uh, so there is no risk of one of these things uh, wandering into the, the solar system, is there? Well, it's possible, but extremely unlikely. 
uh, space is big. There's a, a lot of space to get to things in. And even with numbers that are being suggested at the moment, there are still only likely to be one, um, one planet or less per star. And if you think about how far away the stars are compared to us, having a planet at the same distance really isn't a threat to us. Mm. Yeah. Is there any hypothesis? Uh, I don't know much about this. Ian. So that, you know, there was some idea about a uh, planet nine. Um, so if something wanders into the solar system, I would imagine the sun will capture it, make it go around, <laughs> go around the sun. Uh, is there any any um, speculation uh, that planet nine could be a captured um, wandering star? I mean, wandering we planet. We do have evidence from some other stars that they can capture and lose planets in this kind of way. But actually to capture a planet is quite difficult. Mm. It has to be coming in at the right rate and it has to interact with the system in the right way to actually be captured. Most likely the planet just gets deflected and sent on a different course. Um, so as to whether any kind of planet nine would be a captured planet, it's possible, but Given we have so little evidence for what Planet Nine is, if it exists, then yeah. um, it's it's really hard to tell at this stage. Yeah. So the other Nature paper uh, related, obviously, no large population of unbound or wide orbit Jupiter mass planets, uh, and so the so the initial speculation was there is about two hundred billion of these, and now more recently uh, that estimate has been cut down to 100 billion. So, so what is the data that came more recently to make this conclusion? So um, in terms of the, uh, the Nature paper that got released in 2017, um, this is really just a reanalysis of the same data by the same team. It's the uh, optical gravitational lensing experiment, or OGLE as they like to call themselves, um, which uses a series of um, telescopes around the world to look for gravitational lenses, which is the same method I've been using. Um, and what happens is that they look for brightenings in the um, in a star, and they can use that information to work out whether there's a planet that's passing in front of that star. However, there's a lot of other things that can look like that, um, and ruling out all these false positives, all these things that could be planets and aren't, is a very difficult task. Um, the data that they were working with was ground-based data, so it's taken from the ground, telescopes looking upwards. And it's very difficult from just that data to work out quite what you're looking at. So in this 2017 paper, what they did was they looked at the data again and they ruled out a lot more things they thought were planets, but probably weren't. Hmm. So this is the same transit method that's used uh, to, to look for regular planets? There's, there's different methods that we can use to look for planets. The first is the transit method you've just said, which is basically you pass a planet in front of its host star and it acts like a mini solar eclipse. It blocks out a tiny portion of the light from the star, maybe 1%. And we look for this dip in brightness that occurs regularly every time the planet passes in front of its star. We usually combine this with what's known as the radio velocity technique. And what we do there is we watch the light from the star and see how it gets red shifted and blue shifted by the Doppler effect. It's just the same Doppler effect that we uh, hear when we hear a fire engine or an ambulance or a police car siren go past us and hear the change in pitch um, as, uh, as the sound uh, gets towards us or away from us. It's the same Doppler effect, but we use it with the light. And we can use that to measure how fast the star is going back and forwards as the planet orbits around it. So those are the techniques we use to find close in planets close towards the star. Yeah. To find free floating planets and planets further away from the star, we use different methods called the microlensing method. Um, in circumstances where we can't actually detect the planet itself, what we can do is wait for the planet to pass in front of a completely different star. Mm. So we might look at the star that's 20,000 light years away, and there might be a planet 10,000 light years away that just happens to go near our line of sight to it. And when that happens, what happens? What the planet does is actually lenses the light around itself from the background star to us. So it makes that background star look brighter. Einstein predicted this in 1906, I think it was, 
Um, and it's been successively observed in galaxies and suns and various other systems since then. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So that's what you what you what you call micro lensing. Mm -hmm. uh, micro because the planet is pretty small. Yes. Lensing is the lensing is right. Yeah. And so I was wondering, you know, so there's a lot of data being picked up now. Uh, I know um, the the Roman um, observatory or what, what what whatever it's called uh, <laughs> that that was recently launched is going to uh, is going to pick up a lot more data. So. Are we sort of moving toward some sort of machine learning techniques that, you know, rather than humans going back and looking at this data, some machine can continuously analyze the data and maybe raise red flags or, or whatever? Uh, are we are we doing that or getting closer to that? Um, well, certainly machine learning is a technique that's being used widely in astronomy at the moment. Um, as far as I know, it's not been applied specifically to the case of looking for microlensing events. The big change that we've got is simply the amount of data we've got to go through. Um, instead of relying on bespoke observations, we've got things like um, the Roman telescope, which will be taking observations uh, very frequently of the sky. Um, and we can actually just simply monitor these observations and look out for events of interest. And so we're moving from a, uh, a targeted search for these kind of events to a more general collecting data of the night sky and seeing what we can get out of it. Right, right. So I want to go uh, to a couple of your technical papers. Um, we won't get into uh, <laughs> too much technical details, but I just want to get a get a, a understanding of it. So the first one in 2021, Kepler K2 campaign nine, uh, candidate short duration events from the first space based survey for planetary microlensing. Uh, you say we present the first short duration candidate microlensing events from the Kepler K2 mission uh, from late April to early July 2016, and campaign nine of K2 obtained high temporal cadence observations over a 3.7 square degree region of the galactic barge. Um, so, so is there something special about this, this short duration events, microlensing events? Uh, what what is special about them? So the duration of the events, uh, how long it takes the star to get brighter and fainter again, depends very critically on the mass of the thing that's doing the lensing. So if you have, for example, a star that's being acting, that is acting as a lens, lensing a background star, then the events may take hundreds of days. Whereas if you've got a tiny planet that might be Earth-sized or perhaps even Jupiter-sized or bigger or smaller, then it might take only a few hours or maybe a day or two to actually pass in front of this host star and give this brightening of the uh, the background star that we see. Uh, so you you sort of uh, uh, mentioned as an example something at uh, uh, 20 million light years away that the star itself uh, and the planet passing at 10 million light years away. Uh, it seems like that would be pretty quick, wouldn't it be? I mean. Doesn't the uh, planet need to be closer to the star for it to take hours? So it's uh, it really depends on the speed at which it's going past. Oh. So the the size of the lens that each planet creates depends on its mass. So if you have a look at something um, that's maybe uh, I'm guessing numbers here, but something the size of Jupiter, it might have a Einstein ring radius, that's what we call the size of the lens, that's maybe, at a guess, uh, 100 million kilometers across. So if we pass that Jupiter mass planet in front of a star, then it's really how long it takes it to cover that 200 million kilometer distance, mm -hmm. irregardless of whether it's close to or far away from us compared to the background star. So, so I guess the trick here, that, so, uh, is it true to assume that the free uh, floating planets move a lot slower than typical planets? We don't really know because we can't measure it. Uh, we think that it should, um, the, the velocity of these planets compared to the background stars, which is what matters, um, should be a few kilometers per second. If it was much less than that, then it would violate the conservation of energy because we expect the uh, small things to travel faster than the big things in a distributed system. Um, 
But if it's much more than that, if it's, say, hundreds of kilometres per second, then the planet would simply escape the galaxy. Uh, so it's got to be somewhere in this this broad range where we also see stars move of tens of kilometers per second or thereabouts. And this will, I would imagine, it's a unique event, right? So because you have to have a line of sight at that space time coordinate against that particular star, and it's never going to happen again, right? This, yeah. this is a so one it's, event. it's incredibly rare to see these things. So you might see one event per million stars. Um, per year or something like that. So if you stare at a million stars, it might take you quite a long time to actually discover any of these planets, mm. which is why when we look for these planets, we need to look in somewhere um, that's got a lot of stars. In our case, we choose the, the bulge of our galaxy that's near the centre, um, because that we, when we look at a patch of sky, we actually see millions and millions of stars. And so when we look for a month or two, which is all the telescope time we can get, then we have a hope of picking up a few of these systems, but really not very many. It's a very rare event. Mm. This is uh, this is invisible light then? Um, it is invisible light because we've got the, the best um, ability to choose planets that way. Uh, stars generally uh, emit most invisible light, so we get the most emission um, at these frequencies. And we also get the best sensitivity of our telescopes. If we go too far into the violet or into the infrared, and we start to get a lot of noise, we start to lose the resolution of fidelity to make these kind of observations. So, but, but the lensing effect Einstein proposed is universal to all electromagnetic waves, right? So technically all waves will be lensing. Yes, and we see these lenses in other um, systems like galaxies if we look in the radio or if we look at other frequencies. So we definitely see them in other frequencies. It's just for microlensing observations, it's hard to detect them. Uh, so, so what is sort of the current status of the demographics of these uh, free, free floating planets uh, in terms of number, size? I mean, just very approximately, where, where are we now? We know of a few dozen of them, um, and these have really been dictated by two different kinds of methods. First is the microlensing method that I've uh, noted. The second is the um, uh, the direct imaging method, which um, in, it's basically we actually look for the planets themselves. We look for them in space and we see if we can uh, see the light from them. This only works for massive and young planets, so we've got uh, measures of maybe a dozen or two dozen uh, young planets that are many times the mass of Jupiter. And we've got these uh, these smaller planets, the ones that I've been looking for, which might have the masses of Earth mass or uh, Mars mass or thereabouts that have been kicked out of these stellar systems. And the microlensing method is the only way that we can actually observe these. These seem to be relatively low mass planets. We only have a few of them. Uh, so we're still building up these demographics, really. And that's part of what was going back from 2017 nature paper. Um, this is part of what we're trying to address here. How many of these systems are are there um, and what mass range do they occupy? Um, so you mentioned the mass of the star. That's pretty critical uh, from, from the lensing uh, observation. Does it also give us some measure of the diameter of the, of the planet? Um, so we get what we get is a time scale, the time scale that takes a star to get brighter and fainter. And that's a combination of the velocity of the planets and the mass of the planets, both of which we've just discussed. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about the radius of that planet, so it's very difficult for us to make any further measurements beyond this. Uh, we can make inferences about the background star and what radius it has, but we can't say very much more on the planets themselves. What we have to rely on instead is our models of planet formation, planet evolution that we've seen from planets that are going around their stars, where we can get a lot more data. Mm. And so we can't really have any speculation around the composition of the planet, right? We, we just know its mass. Yes, but from its mass, we can actually tell quite a lot. So if we have something that's the mass of the Earth, we expect it to have fairly Earth-like characteristics. Mm. Um, if it was a gassy body that size, it probably wouldn't be able to hold itself together. Okay. However, yeah. if we had a uh, body of the mass of, say, Jupiter, then it wouldn't be able to lose the hydrogen and helium that um, is in it 
in order to make something that has an Earth-like composition. So if we see something that's the mass of Jupiter, then we know it's going to be a gas giant. If we see something the mass of Earth, it's most likely to be a rocky planet. And there's this whole range in between where we don't really know what's going on in terms of planets that are far from their star. Um, we can only have constraints for planets close to their star. Yeah, just wondering, Ian, uh, since these are free, free floating, um, they're not close to a star. So they're, they're, you know, they're a cold space. Uh, how will a Jupiter-like planet exist in such a cold space with no energy coming to it? But it's, it's its own generated energy, right? Yes, planets have quite a lot of energy that comes from their own heat. So young planets can still have quite a lot of heat from their formation. We've had um, big flows of gas piling onto these planets for thousands of years. And that, that collision process generates a lot of heat inside the planet. Mm. So this is the, how the direct imaging method that I described works is you look for these planets still glowing because they still haven't cooled down from their formation. If we look at smaller bodies, so like say the Earth, um, then we can see that we've got geothermal energy on Earth. We've got, um, in the oceans, we've got these black smokers, uh, the, the geysers that come up from uh, deep underneath the mantle. We've got volcanoes, we've got other geothermal activity. And any other planet, regardless of where it is compared to its star, or if it doesn't have a star, it will still have these processes going on. So there will mm. still be some heat on the surface. What it won't get is the heat from its star like we get from the sun. So it will be quite cold on the surface, but that doesn't mean that things like liquid water, for example, couldn't exist on parts of the planet. Mm. However, if you had an Earth-like atmosphere, that would probably rain out onto the surface. So we'd, we, we couldn't have habitable worlds out there. Um, but we could have reservoirs where, for example, life might still exist under the surface. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, it is also a low radiation environment. Um, and so presumably it, it's actually potentially more amenable to life if there is heat underneath the surface. It's possible. I mean, life depends on receiving energy from somewhere. If we get light from the sun, then we've got a lot more energy than light from uh, the energy from geothermal activity deep in space. Um, in terms of radiation, there's actually a protective effect from the um, the solar magnetosphere. So this is the, the magnetosphere that the Voyager probes have recently crossed uh, way out in space. Um, and that protects us from a lot of cosmic radiation. However, if we were on one of these planets, then we'd get the same protection from the uh, the miles of ice that being built up on the surface as in the oceans that might have been on them cooled. So that there's there's a lot of factors that go in there in terms of whether you can sustain life on one of these planets or not. Mm. It'd be tough living on such a planet. Every every day you wake up, you see a different different. <laughs> every night you see a different sky. Uh, you keep moving, right? Uh, it will be quite a strange. We are moving through space. If you track yeah. the movements of the stars through thousands of years, you'll actually see them change quite noticeably. Um, but in, certainly it's perpetual night on these planets, so you wouldn't see very much changing on a uh, meaningful time scale. But over billions of years, of course, these planets cross the cosmos. And, um, they've encountered many different things upon the way. Right. So there was a recent paper um, in 2022, uh, again, Kepler K2 campaign nine, uh, first space-based discovery of an exoplanet using microlensing. Um, so you say we reported the discovery of a bound exoplanetary microlensing event from a blind search of data gathered from campaign nine of the Kepler K2 mission. Uh, so this is uh, sort of the traditional planet. Uh, so the K2 campaign nine, if I, I don't know if I understood it. You are looking back at the Galactic Center. Yes, so this is the original data that we used in the Galactic Center. Um, we took it back in 2016, but it's taken quite a lot of painstaking analysis to actually pull out these planets. When we looked at it, we, we sampled a, a small region of the sky, but that returned one billion data points over two months, and that took some looking through. So there's lots of things in there that look like these planets, um, and we need to rule them out um, in order to say that, yes, these are likely to be planets. So what we do is we go through them and look for things that we know about, things like variable stars, and asteroids, 
um, and then look for things that we don't know about, like flares going on um, low mass stars that can make them brighter, um, and other variable stars that we don't know about these kind of events. And what we're left with is things that have the signatures of um, free floating planets, namely a very symmetrical rise and fall of the light curve. Mm. So we found four of these, these candidate free floating planets in this two months of data, um, which is significant in itself. But we also found a fifth object, and that didn't show this same rise and fall. It actually showed um, a sort of bullhorn kind of uh, figure where it rose very sharply in brightness and then declined off and then rose again and fell off again. And this kind of brightening is seen sometimes when you have a planet that's going around its star in a conventional sense, um, and it also gets microlensed. And in this case, uh, we've managed to actually get data from ground-based telescopes at the same time. The Kepler satellite um, is quite a long way from Earth. It's about 100, kilome 100 million kilometers away. Um, and that difference actually makes a difference to what we see in the brightness of the star that's being lensed. Because if we've got a, a lens that's 100, 100 million kilometers across, and we sample it from two points that's spaced 100 million kilometers apart, we actually see a very different cut through the lens. And mm. so we get a very different cut through this brightness profile. So if we measure the um, brightness of a star, any star from Earth and from nearby spacecraft, then we expect to see the same thing. The fact that we don't indicates that we're looking at some small scale thing like microlensing. And actually we can model this microlensing, model how, um, how these brightness distributions should work. And we see that we get a slow microlensing signal from the star that it's going around, but we also get um, peaks from where the planet is lensing the background star itself. So we've got a star and a planet that are traveling through space together, that are both microlensing a background star that we struggle to see. Mm. So by modeling the, the different timescales involved, we can actually say something about this, um, this star and this planet. And we can say that this the lensing star is about half the mass of the sun. And we can say that the planet that's going around it is about five times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, so the distance from Jupiter from the Earth, um, and it's about the same mass as Jupiter. So we've got a planet that's like Jupiter, and it's going around the star half the mass of the Sun. So uh, typically microlensing is not used to uh, look at or, or find exoplanets that are bound to stars. It sounds like microlensing could be a third possible technique uh, to, to find one of them, right? It has been used, but rarely. The fact that we have to look for some of these stars to actually find microlensing planets is why it's not used very generally, but it actually fills an important niche in space. When we look at um, what we want to do is look for something that's like Earth. We want to look at something that's um, the distance of uh, Earth away from the sun, and we want to look for something that's about the mass of the Earth. So we want to find somewhere that's got the right temperature, and the right mass in order to, to be a habitable, pla habitable planet around another star. Now, to do that, we can use the techniques like the transit method and the radio velocity method that I mentioned, um, but that's sensitive to planets near to their star. If we want to look at planets far away from their star, we need to use a different method, and that's either direct imaging that I've mentioned, but that only finds massive planets, mm. or we can look for microlensing planets that might be quite low mass, and the sweet spots for each of these techniques are very different, but they overlap about the position of Earth. Mm. So it's a combination of finding these planets through microlensing and then following them up using these radio velocity methods, these transit methods, to try and actually find Earth-like planets going around other stars. So all these techniques are useful. It's the combination of them that makes the most sense. Mm. It's really interesting. So I want to touch on two of your um projects you're working on. <laughs> uh, one is uh, the paper is old, but this is an ongoing thing. So Excel's uh, an exoplanet legacy science proposal for the ESA Euclid mission one, cold exoplanets. Uh, you see Euclid is the second M-class mission of the ESA cosmic vision program with the principal science goal of studying dark energy. Euclid is also expected to undertake additional legacy science programs 
And one proposal is the uh, Exoplanet Euclid Legacy Survey Excels, which will be the first survey able to measure the abundance of exoplanets down to Earth mass for host separations from um, one astronomical unit out to the free floating unbound regime. So this is what you talked about. So sort of very much like an Earth-like system, uh, about the same distance from the sun, about the same mass, same size, and so on. So these are at least the our current understanding is that these are more likely to have potential life, right? Yeah, so we, we need something that's not too cold, not too hot. So in this Goldilocks zone in the middle, that's uh, um, at temperatures where liquid water can exist. We also need something that's got a surface. And finding that combination is quite difficult. We end up with gas giants that are too close, too far away from the star. Um, those are the easy ones to detect. The Earth mass planets were quite difficult. So to do that, we need a different class of telescopes and a different regime of looking at them. Now, there's various ways we can do that, but the advantage that we've demonstrated with Kepler data is that we can go to space and then we're not obscured by problems with the Earth's atmosphere, uh, the fact that stars twinkle, the fact that uh, we have uh, weather on Earth. In fact, we have daylight. We don't have to worry about all that. We can just point the spacecraft at a position in the sky and monitor it for ages, for weeks or months on end. What we want to do is to go to um, the same targets that we looked at and try and find new planets, but with more sensitive spacecraft that can hopefully detect more of them and lower mass planets much closer to the Earth mass rather than the half to one Jupiter mass planets that we're looking at at the moment. Now, to do that, we can use various different spacecraft, um, but the uh, there's an upcoming mission called Euclid that you mentioned, um, and this is much more capable of doing this. It can not only do this in the optical, but it can also do this in the infrared. So um, although I said that the infrared is less useful, it can still be useful for looking at lower mass stars um, or red stars um, that are red for other reasons. So we can we can use this telescope to look at a much bigger field of view, so it encompass more stars, have more chance of finding planets, and we can uh, look at higher resolution data. The, the, Kepler, the, the Kepler spacecraft that I was talking about is not well designed for the purpose that we used it for. It's got huge pixels um, in terms of area on the sky. Um, it's four arc seconds across. And if you compare that to the moon, it sounds small. The moon's 1,800 uh, arc seconds across. So it's a tiny patch of sky per pixel. But still, there's maybe 20 or 30 stars in there. And the light from one can easily get drowned out. If we go to Euclid, we're looking at 0.1 arc second pixels, so a factor of 40 smaller. Mm. Um, and this difference means that we're looking at individual stars and we can see how individual stars respond uh, when planets and other stars pass in front of them. So we can get much more accurate measurements and much lower mass planets using something like the Euclid Space Telescope. The mm. other advantage of going to space as well is that, as I mentioned, we get a different signal from space and from the ground. So we can use the combination to actually prove that what we're looking at is a planet and not just some uh, random brightening of the star. Mm. You, you say here, uh, Ian, we assess how many of these events will be detectable planetary signatures using a detailed multi-wavelength microlensing simulator, MAPLES, uh, which incorporates the, uh, the galactic model with 3D, uh, 3D extinction. So this is some sort of a computer model that, that simulates the system so that you can sort of figure out what, <laughs> what you might see. So with, with any set of astronomical data, when you're making some proposal on this kind of scale, you want to model it to see what you can expect to get. Um, in this case, we've been working with a team in France, uh, the Besançon uh, team, and they have constructed a model of the galaxy. And you can query this model and pull out in any particular direction and at any particular wavelength, the number of stars and the distribution of stars that you can expect to see. So what we did was we took that set of stars, I must stress this isn't my work, it's the work of Matthew Penny, who's currently at Ohio, um, and he took these stars and the simulated and put those through a fake telescope. So we mocked up the Euclid telescope and we passed these stars through them and we got back images of what we could expect to see. 
Mm. Now, with these stars, we've passed planets in front, you know, fake planets in front of them, you know, thousands and thousands of times, and we modeled what we could expect to see in terms of which of those planets we could recover. So using these kind of methods, we can have a, a fair idea of what we can expect from these kind of missions, these kind of observations, if we have a good understanding of what the distribution of planet masses actually is. You can also train a model with that type of data to go look at real data and pick up real things, right? Yes, yeah, so it, um, there's a lot of efforts in machine learning and you know, other uh, high-level computing software to actually look for um, recognizable signals and separate them from the noise. So if we have something like a stellar flare, it might be differentiable from something like a uh, microlensing exoplanet. And the distinction can be difficult to identify, but if we have enough observed exoplanets, which we don't have at the moment, um, but if we can get enough using something like Euclid, then we can have a, a training sample on which we can use machine learning, and that might be useful for later missions. There's another project you're working on. So W first, I guess W first has been renamed to Roman. Mm -hmm, that's right. Uh, so Roman and Euclid enabling the microlensing parallax measurement from space. Um, so you say um, uh, W first uh, Roman is expected to detect hundreds of free floating planets, uh, but it will not be able to measure their masses. How will simultaneous microlensing observations by both Euclid and Roman sp uh, spacecraft? So you say a W for spacecraft. Is is that different from the telescope? Um, so usually we have a, a satellite and it usually only contains one telescope. So in this case, the W first telescope is the same as the W first spacecraft. Okay, okay. So uh, simultaneous microns observations separated by hundred thousand kilometer in orbits around the Sun Earth L2 point, that's where Roman is, will enable measurements of microns in parallax. So um, I, I can't quite remember, uh, Ian, I thought Roman was in um, uh, uh, in infrared, not not visible light. So, uh, now you're stretching my memory. Um, so, I believe that Roman, that we're intending to use Roman in the near infrared, so that's the, the portion slightly red of the visible, but not into the, the kind of infrareds like you might expect with thermal imaging cameras and things like that. So it's it's small around the the wavelengths around one micron that we're using it. OK, so so that might be sort of a, a good uh, position for microlensing studies, right? So combining that with Euclid. So so what do you get, you know, with this combination? What what is the power here? So if you remember what I was saying about the lens, and we take different sections through the lens depending on where our telescope is. So we have a telescope in, in the ground, a telescope in space, we should see the star that's in the background being lensed and getting brighter by two different amounts at two different times, depending on where the observatory is. So if we have two observatories in space, then we can continuously stay at a position in space and recover um, the two different brightnesses of the star. If we can see that microlensing signature being different in the two telescopes, then we can work out um, various parameters of the system. Firstly, we can say it's a microlensing planet, not just the star getting bright on its own, but we can also make measurements of how fast the planet is moving compared to the Earth, and how fast the um, how much mass the, the planet therefore has. We can decouple these two phenomena. If we've got a third observatory on Earth, and that's completes a triangulation, we can make these measurements to much greater precision. So it's by adding these different telescopes that seeing slightly different things and taking slightly different cuts through this gravitational lens uh, that we can actually recover systems uh, with much more detail, like accurate masses compared to what we can just using one telescope. Hmm. So, so in conclusion, Ian, um, I know that the, the regular exoplanets, we are up to 5,000, 6,000, I can't quite remember, it keeps changing every day. Uh, mm -hmm. You are to a dozen of these free floating planets, and it seemed to be there are a lot more uh, ideas around finding them. Uh, and you believe there is 100 billion of them floating around just in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh -huh. So assuming that you build up a, a big demographics of these free floating planets, 
what would be sort of what are the implications? What, what do you want to really study <laughs> on them? And, and what do you think would be the most interesting? There's a variety of things that we can look at um, with them. And as I've said, they're very hard to find, which is why there might be many of them, but we don't know about it. Uh, the first is to look at how material is moved around the galaxy. So we've seen things like the asteroid Umaumau, um, which passed through the solar system recently, and we think it came from a completely different star. Mm. Now, where do these kind of objects come from? Are they thrown out of these stars in the same way? Or not, we don't really know. We don't understand where these things are coming from and where they're going to. Perhaps that was part of a fractured planet that either never formed or was destroyed. Um, we've no idea. What we want to do more generally is to look at this entire process. How do these things get kicked out, whether it's asteroids or planets or anything like that, um, and look at how, how these systems are forming and evolving. We see a whole variety of different exoplanets out there. We see planets that are going around the star, planets like Jupiter going around the stars every few hours even, never mind every few years. We see such diversity of systems that don't really correspond to what we expected when we looked at the solar system first. We expect to see you know, dwarf rocky planets in the middle and gas giants further out. And we see a lot of systems that don't correspond to these. How do these systems form? Um, how do they evolve as the stars evolve? Uh, how do planets interact with each other? We can answer all these questions by looking at the star formation process and by the planets that get kicked out during that period. So we hope to really understand the process of star formation through understanding these planets. And of course, the process of star formation and planet formation then impacts on the chance of getting extraterrestrial life. You know, how habitable is the galaxy? Ultimately, we all want to find aliens, but uh, that's quite a long, a long shot at the moment. So we can take steps towards that direction by answering some of these questions. Do you see any sort of new physics that, uh, I mean, you mentioned here uh, in the Euclid context about studying dark energy. Uh, do you think these measurements give us uh, some additional insights into dark, dark energy and other type of things? Um, it's well, part of the thing is we don't know what we're going to get. We don't know what we're going to observe. And it might be that some serendipitous observations occur that we will find new physics from this. Um, in terms of the, the telescopes that we're using, both Euclid and W first are designed to find dark energy and measure dark energy and work out what it is. Um, we're just hijacking these telescopes to, to um, look for planets and solve a slightly different question. So in terms of using these to find out what dark energy is, I think probably not, but we might find something else that's interesting along the way. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Ian. Thanks so much for spending time with me. You're welcome.